Hello and welcome. Today we are going to cover yet another very important topic. Well, it is more interesting than it is important. And that's why I choose to take a little unconventional approach to explain this concept to you. We'll first be looking at the data. That is the practical sense of what we are trying to convey. And then we'll move on to the definition. Hope you like it. Let's get started. So let us start off with a simple experiment. In our video on introduction to normal distribution, we talked about a random variable. Well, a random variable was an output of a random experiment. And a random experiment means there is no bias in the system. The likelihood of occurrence is same for every event. So let us say we are performing one such experiment where we have been asked to toss a coin. A simple coin which could result into a head or a tail. And each time that we perform this experiment, we note down the observation. So let's just look at this. So say in trial one, we toss the coin, we got a head. Trial two, we toss the coin, we got a tail. Then we got a head, we got a tail, we got a head. Our task is to note down the number of heads that we get when we toss a simple fair coin five times. And that completes one experiment. In this case, you see that the count of heads is three. Let's say we do it one more time. We get a tail, then we get a head, we get a tail, we get a head, and we get a tail again. So if we were to count the number of heads, in this case, the number of heads is two. So let's further extend the experiment that we just discussed. Let's assume that the same experiment is repeated multiple times. To obtain each entry of our population, a fair coin was tossed five times, and we have noted down the number of heads Therefore, each entry could range anywhere between 0 to 5. We completed 10,000 such experiments. So what we've got here is a number associated with each experiment. And remember that one experiment involves five coin tosses. So let's say in our first observation, when we tossed five coins, we could get only two heads. Likewise, if we come down here, in the seventh observation, when we tossed five coins, we got just one head. So this is how we are noting it down again and again, and we go on up till 10,000. So we've repeated this experiment multiple times. Now, as you must have observed, tossing a coin is both random and independent. And here, we also note down the average, the average of total number of heads that we've obtained by tossing these coins 10,000 times. Now we further extend that experiment. So we've created a population of 10,000 observations by tossing coins and counting the number of heads. Now what we're going to do is from that population of 10,000, we are going to take samples one by one. And we are going to take each sample of sample size 15. So we'll take 15 observations from the population of 10,000 at a time, and we'll call it sample one. Then again, we'll go back and take another 15 observations and we'll call it sample two. So we took 100 such samples, each of size 15, and computed the average of each sample. So now we have a distribution of 100 samples. The serial number here represents the number of observations in a sample, and we've taken hundred such samples. And lastly, what we have done is for each sample, we have computed the average. Now let's move back to the slides to understand and interpret what we just did. We started with a simple experiment and each experiment involved tossing a coin five times. Noting down the number of heads was our objective. So we repeated the same experiment about 10,000 times. And for each time we tossed five coins and counted the number of heads. Then we took a sample of 15 observations at a time and call it sample one. We again took a sample of another 15 observations and call it sample two. We took hundred such samples and we took an average of each sample. So we have total of hundred averages available with us. Let's say when we plot the population, those 10,000 observations that we had, we know the output in our case could only be discrete because we are counting the number of heads and it could range only from a zero to a five. 
zero being minimum and five being the maximum. So let's say when we graph it, this is how we get it for our population. For those 10,000 observations, there are different frequencies. So there are lesser number of times when we get zeros, there is no head at all in five experiments. And there are more times that we get all five heads. This is just a random output. Now, if the same graph, the one that we've chosen here, was to be changed into a line graph, this is how the shape looks like. This is a discrete distribution. However, if we were going to plot the distribution of the sample means, those 100 samples that we took, and we calculated a mean for each sample, if we were going to plot that distribution into a graph, which is an output of the population only, this is what we get. Now, as you see, what's interesting here is to note down that a curve which was nowhere close to being normal. You can see that line graph onto the top right or the bar graph onto the left. None of them look close to being normal. We've covered normal distribution in our previous video. But when we look at the sample means and the distribution of the sample means, you can see that it's attaining the shape of a bell. So it is approaching close to being normal. Another interesting property to observe here is when we calculate the means. So if we calculate the mean of the population, those 10,000 observations that we had, it comes out to be 2.51. And if we calculate the mean of all the sample means that we had, what we get is 2.52. And these are fairly overlapping. So with this, we move to the definition of central limit theorem. Like I stated, it's quite opposite of what we typically do, but I think it will help you associate with the definition more now that you know the practical meaning of what we just did. So the definition says that central limit theorem or CLT states that for a large sample size in most situations, sampling distribution of the mean of an independent random variable follows a normal or nearly normal distribution. We saw that just now, that we were performing an experiment which had a discrete output. It was nowhere close to being continuous. However, when we took multiple samples from the same discrete population and plotted the sample means, it tends to follow a normal distribution. What's important here is to note down that we're talking about a large sample size. Do we have an exact number for being large? Well, it varies from case to case. If your population is already normally distributed, then even a smaller sample size would let you achieve a normal distribution for the sample means. However, when you have a population that's discrete or does not follow a specific pattern, then you might have to look at larger samples to achieve a normality. But the important point to be noted here is that irrespective of the parent population, the sample means tend to achieve a nearly normal distribution when we talk about large sample size. Just as we saw, a discrete population generating a nearly normal distribution when we plotted its sample means. The second part, central limit theorem states that given a sufficiently large sample size, the means of all samples from the same population will be approximately equal to the mean of the population. We saw this as well. The population mean was 2.51 and the mean of all the samples that we took was 2.52. So the means also tend to overlap. So the central limit theorem here states these two important properties. It is a very important concept for people to understand and it has wide applicability in the field of statistics and data science. Do understand it properly. It's going to help you a lot with a lot of concepts in future. I hope you liked this video and if you did, then please don't forget to subscribe. For now, I thank you for your time.